Yes, yes. Our my my internet line has been cut, so connectivity is very poor. Dr. Datta will provide the talk, and and he will be the coordinator from our end. So Lovely. I think Sutirtha will start with the talk, if you like, if everybody is yes. online. Okay, that's right. I think we are online and we are ready to start. Uh, Please go ahead. So just uh, everyone, I'm just going to mute everybody, and I'm going to unmute our speakers for today. Second, B C B C B C is going to do the intro. Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, yeah. So, hello everyone. Welcome to another uh, edition of Deccan Murders webinar series. Uh, our today's speaker uh, speakers are Dr. Jala and Dr. Sukirta. So, I would uh, request uh, our Not honorable to. member B C Chaudhary sir to introduce them to us, please. Sir, over to you. Sure, sure. I'll do that. No, not a problem at all. Okay. Good evening, everybody. I think it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, both Dr. Yv Jala and Dr. Sutita Datta. And uh, both of them, you know, at least Yv Jala was my colleague and Sutita joined a little later than after my superannuation. But Dr. Jala, I know him from the time, you know, he was doing his PhD on black box uh, in the state of Gujarat. But uh, from since his black box days, he has gone a long way. You know, he has worked uh, with every single carnivore you can think of. Now he's actually known more as the tiger man of India rather than any other thing. You know, but his his uh, best work is possibly with the wolves and uh, the uh, Asiatic lion in the deer forest. Uh, but currently, he and uh, Sutit are leading the uh, program on the Great Indian Bustard uh, and. Uh, I think you know they will give a wonderful talk about you know what they are doing with the Great Indian Bustard. Sutita is an applied ecologist and a faculty in the Wildlife Institute of India. And uh, uh, Sutita is a great speaker. And uh, hopefully, I think he will take us through a journey uh, that all of us think you know GIB is a, is a story of despair. But after hearing his uh, talk and after hearing inputs from Dr. Jala, you will act this thing and I'll stop at that. I think you know the introduction of the speakers will be in their talks rather than my speaking about them. Thank you very much. Over to Sutirtha as he starts giving his talk. Sutirtha, over to you. Thank you, sir. Let me uh, share my screen with you so that uh, you can see the presentation as well. Yes, uh, we can see the screen. Is it, uh, is it visible to all of you? Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Murti, uh, P.C. Chaudhary Saab, and uh, Srikant, and all the others um, for inviting us in this webinar. Um, now, as we know, Indian bustards are on the brink of extinction. And there is no doubt about that. Now, how did they reach this point? And what is being done uh, for them to return from this, from this point? And is there any hope? These are the issues that we'll be discussing in uh, today's talk. Um, I, along with uh, Dr. Vaidhi Shala, we are uh, coordinating the Busted Recovery Program, which is a collaborative initiative of the Wildlife Institute of India, Ministry of Environment, Forest, Climate Change, and the Rajasthan uh, government, along with other state forest departments, uh, to implement holistic conservation actions for the species. And before uh, talking a little bit on our work, I will try to uh, take you uh, through the course of history of mustard um, natural history and conservation. So let me begin by showing you a typical habitat of the Great Indian Mustard. This is a glimpse of Thar. And much of India, uh, geologically and historically, has remained grasslands and deserts like this that were used by nomadic pastoralists. But during the colonial policies, these habitats, they were scarred as uh, unproductive wastelands, uh, something that is, uh, that is created by uh, human overuse, overexploitation, and must be converted into more, more productive uses, such as agriculture, and more recently, renewable energy development, and so on. Uh, now, what has happened over the years uh, is that these habitats 
have changed drastically and uh, they are iconic species such as uh, the great indian bustard and uh, many others have slowly lost the habitats that they earlier inhabited now india's grasslands and deserts uh, where traditionally they were cultivated uh, only once in a year and typically with the monsoons and this led to a large fallow period and with that uh, the wildlife used to uh, were, were very compatible with these kind of land uses uh, but gradually progressively much of these grasslands were brought under intensive cultivation with many mechanized and uh, inorganic farming techniques that resulted in the loss of pastures but while the pastures kept depleting uh, the livestock production and their dependency on grasslands they kept increasing to meet our daily demands and because of that there was a reduction in vegetation cover now alongside these there were several ill conceived forestry policies which flowed from this uh, colonial diktat of planting grasslands and deserts with uh, exotic tree species and that was that resulted in a lot of encroachment woody encroachment in these grasslands in many cases Uh, which are largely incompatible with the native wildlife that prefer this certain openness so because of these cumulative effects the habitats that are required for grassland specialists started reducing and getting degraded and the group of species that was most affected by these changes are the bustards there are two uh, there are actually three resident bustards of india Uh, out of them two are found in the western and central parts of uh, and also the deccan uh, peninsula which are typical uh, arid grassland and uh, desert biomes the larger of them the great indian bustard ardeotis nigricevs you can see uh, their images over here uh, they have they were once distributed over the western half of india but over the last five decades they have reduced by 90% in their numbers and their range and currently there is just about 100 to 150 individuals which are largely restricted to small pockets the largest of them is in jaisalmer these numbers that you see over there are a little older from one of our publication but the current numbers over there uh, over here are just about uh, 100 and very small fragmented populations in kutch uh, and uh, in bellari karnool and solapur areas now in this picture you can see a great indian bustard male that is uh, displaying very flamboyantly uh to attract the females and you can also see the female which is relatively much shy the lesser florican is a very understudied uh, species and uh, their population is also very uh, low and fragmented and the breeding population is largely in small pockets all over northwest uh, india uh, and central india and the non breeding habitats are in deccan peninsula Uh, they also have a very small population which sort of fluctuate with rain because they breed during the rains and that is the time when you uh, when you see them and when the rains are more you tend to see more birds because they become more visible so we do not have a good handle uh, on this species uh, we did not have a good handle on this species but their population was certainly quite low uh, making them endangered too now what is this what is this thing what is this element that makes this particular group so vulnerable compared to other grassland species and the answer lies in their slow life history traits they have very poor reproductive rates that cannot sustain any additional loss of adult birds now historically bustards have been hunted as game be it the great indian bustard or the bengal florican or the lesser florican uh, when you read uh, hunting stories uh, you find ample um, records of these species being hunted as game and just after independence the number of bustards had already precipitated to just over 1000 which was already uh, quite low uh, currently hunting or rather poaching has been curbed quite a bit and to some extent by default because of the low numbers in which they are however it has been replaced by fatal collisions with power lines if you can see in this uh, in uh, to the right uh you will see some diagrams of the frontal vision of different birds it so happens that bustards have a very small frontal vision and a very heavy flight because of which they cannot detect the approaching uh, power lines uh, these thin wires which are currently uh, distributed all over their flight paths 
And when they detect it, it is far too late for them to maneuver across. And because of this, we have been observing, recording uh, mortality of uh, birds operating in bustards in new power lines. Now, in addition to this, uh, because of human interventions, uh, there are many new predators and non-native species in some bustard habitats. For example, in the Desert National Park, uh, there is a large population of dogs, um, pigs, Bengal fox, uh, which are many, which are more basic species and non-native ones. And many of them are uh, nest predators. And because of their overabundance, uh, the potential predation rate on nests are also very high. And this we have found out based on its, our uh, monitoring of uh, dummy nests and also wild nest monitoring. Uh, close to about 40% of eggs are, 60% um, of eggs are predated most likely uh, in the current times. Now these predators, they have exploded in some of the busted habitats because of uh, anthropogenic intervention, such as provisioning of water through irrigation or uh, by making groundwater available. And what it does is that uh, we found out that the non-native species, uh, such as the dogs or Bengal fox, Indian fox, and blue bull, they have 24 times greater water visitation rate compared to native species, such as ting chinkara or desert fox, and so on. After you correct for the abundance differences, and this was based on camera-based work. So what it means is that earlier, when water was not available across the deserts and dry grasslands, this, this unavailability of water has kept a natural limit to many of these non-native species which are currently flourishing in these deserts because of provisioning of water, um, water in the in, uh, bustard habitats. And because of them, the prediction rate on these uh, eggs have increased. Now, a similar, uh, very detailed studies have been carried out on great bustard, which is a similar species but found in Europe. And they show something very similar that these species have a very high juvenile mortality, but adults have a very uh, long lifespan and, uh, and a high survival. So by the time the chicks reach 30, uh, reach a year, almost 40% of them, just 40% of them have survived. So what it means is that, uh, the adult birds are actually, the adult female is actually able to recruit only a very few offsprings over its entire reproductive span. Which, and what it means is that even under you know, normal ecological, usual ecological conditions, their population grows very slowly and steadily. But as soon as, and Great Indian Buster follows a very similar life history pattern, but as soon as there are additional mortality due to human causes, such as power line collisions or hunting, their population is bound to decline. As you can see over here in this purple uh, trajectory, these are predictions based on demographic models uh, where you can predict how a population will behave under certain conditions, depending on their reproductive rate and so on. So this has been the real uh, you know, Achilles heel for the Great Indian Buster, certainly, that this additional loss of adult birds due to human causes are unsustainable. Even if they are very small numbers, like two or three birds from a population of 150, such as the one in Thar. And this has been one of the main reasons behind the catastrophic decline of uh, these species. Now, the concerns for Buster conservation uh, have been there among conservationists for a very long time. They were always aware of the decline of these species. And over several meetings and workshops, they have gathered and tried to strategize conservation measures. Now, one of these workshops was held in Jaipur in 1982. And in the aftermath of this workshop, and also with the implementation of Wildlife Protection Act, uh, there were several busted protected areas that were created. Now, protected area network-based conservation is a very uh, time-proven tool to create wildlife refugees and conserved species. But for the Great Indian Buster, it did not work very well in the way protected areas were uh, created. Uh, there were a few reasons behind that. One is that during creation, creating, some of these protected areas were extremely large and inclusive of private land, common land, revenue lands, which are used by people without settlement of land rights. Gradually over the years, human population and their dependency had increased inside these parks. And 
it has become unsustainable. However, the stringent legislation that are associated with these protected areas have created a sense of antagonism among these people, a sense of lack of development within these parks, development that are not necessarily compatible with the busters. And in some cases, uh, such as um, Carrera, this has also led to persecution of the buster. The overprotection that have come with the sanctuary declaration in Carrera resulted in an explosion of lack of population, depredation of crops, and eventually people's backlash that led to the extinction of the species from this park. Now, many, uh, some of the protected areas that are that come in this category of very large uh, um, protected areas with a lot of people inside are the Desert National Park, the Nanaj Bus Buster Sanctuary, which was recently rationalized, and so on. On the other end of these protected areas were some very small parks that typically encompass the breeding refuges, and they could not uh, encompass or they could not accommodate the year-round ecological requirements of the species. So busters are landscape level species. They require larger areas. And however, uh, there was a lack of detailed understanding on the habitats, the resources, and the level of disturbances that they can tolerate uh, over, their entire, um, uh, over their entire year, and particularly in the non breeding season. And in the dearth of such information, the landscapes, buster landscapes, had changed dramatically. And our management policy, management and policy did not ha have the tool uh, or the equipment to deal with these problems because uh, we only had this protected area based approach. And because of these issues with the protected area based approach, it did not work really well for the species. Subsequently, around 2013, with renewed research and advocacy carried out by many um, organizations, uh, including WII, BNHS, Conservation India. Uh, there was a renewed uh, impetus on uh, buster conservation and uh, through consultative workshops involving scientists and conservation managers, these national buster recovery plans were developed and adopted by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Management. And this became a guideline, uh, like the skeleton, of uh, following uh, conservation measures uh, in the subsequent times. So this plan, it broadly uh, recommends four uh, action-oriented goals. Firstly, to improve breeding success in the wild by creating um, relatively small but uh, adequate uh, breeding enclosures by predator grouping them so that the recruitment is more and also intensively patrolling them and keeping them inviolate of uh, consumptive users uh, during the peak monsoon when the birds breed. Now here, we're not talking about very large areas but small patches of about 10 square kilometers which are known breeding sites of the species. Secondly, to reduce the mortality risk of the birds in the wild. Uh, for that, to prioritize areas for conservation through surveys and telemetry, and then to mitigate detrimental infrastructure such as power lines in those areas. Thirdly, to reduce local antagonism by linking livelihoods with conservation through incentives and working with the communities. And finally, since all these uh, actions have to be uh, have to be implemented over large landscapes that are inhabited by the busters, which is a inherently time consuming procedure. But the busters are running out of time. We need to secure a captive population for insurance against total extinction and reintroduction in uh, in favorable future. So with these uh, broad action plans. Uh, Many organizations, including WI, but uh, many others like WWF, uh, BNHS, uh, Corbett Foundation, uh, more recently WCS and ERDS Foundation, they have started uh, taking their uh, measures in uh, towards these broad ends, towards these broad goals. So, where do we stand now in terms of the Great Indian Bustard? So, the largest population of this species, probably the only viable one. Uh, occurs in Jaisalmer, and uh, over the last uh, several years, from 2014 to 17, uh, there were surveys that were conducted uh, by WI in collaboration with Rajasthan Forest Department that involved a large number of volunteers and frontline staff who were trained, uh, who tried to search for these birds over this large landscape of about 20,000 square kilometer area, and uh, we found that there are about 128 uh, birds. Um, with a range of standard error of about 19 uh, in this landscape, this was back in 2017-18, uh, that are found in two main populations, 
one being the Rizal National Park, Sudasri and its adjoining areas, and north of it, uh, these northern areas have seen a rapid uh, expansion of uh, renewable energy, particularly wind turbines, uh, to which the population of uh, birds have declined over there. And an even larger population in field firing range, which is basically a Indian Army controlled area where the bird that the birds prefer because of its inviolate nature. Now, subsequently, we had worked with the uh, Indian Army, tried to uh, sensitize them through meetings and workshops and uh, on their role and uh, their importance in busted conservation. And I've also conducted uh, surveys uh, with them uh, in the range. Uh, where uh, we found a minimum population, uh, this is just the minimum count that we found of, uh, of about 40 uh, individuals. This was back in uh, 2008. Uh, so coming to the lesser floricant, this has remained a very understudied species. And apart from uh, some behavioral observations during the breeding time, much of its biology still remains unknown. And late Dr. Ravi Shankaran used to carry out systematic surveys in its breeding range during the monsoon. That is the only time when you can see these species uh, because the males, they jump, they perform this aerial uh, display um, which to attract females again, which, and that is the only, uh, only time you can see these birds. So again, we joined hands, a lot of organizations, uh, we joined hands and we carried out a national level uh, work that included uh, BNHS, Corbett Foundation, HITICOS, um, a WIA, and obviously with the partnership of the state forest departments, we carried out these range level uh, surveys and we found that there are about 340 uh, breeding males, uh, breeding territories uh, across their entire range. And these are largely present in uh, two populations, one in Bhavnagar, which is in Gujarat, and another in a place called Shoklia in Ajmer. And both of these places have about roughly about 100 uh, breeding territories. Now, out of these breeding territories, it is really unknown where the birds go. There are speculations that they go for, uh, you know, um, go back to uh, Deccan. There are certainly a lot of non-breeding records from Deccan, but their movements between the breeding and non-breeding habitats are still largely unknown. So, here you can see the distribution of the birds in Ajmer. They are distributed over a large, much larger area of about 1,000 square kilometers. Whereas in Bhavnagar, uh, this is in Ajmer, in Shoklia. Whereas in Bhavnagar, they are packed within a very small grassland of a few square kilometers. And almost the same number of birds, um, close to about 100. And this indicates a very interesting uh, feature of their behavioral flexibility to these habitat changes. Uh, so lesser floricon traditionally is an exploded lake species. It forms this dispersed arenas where the males display from, uh, which are Uh, Dr. Shatirka, looks like we have lost you there. Umesh, you can hear me, right? Yeah, I think they lost us. They lost the speaker, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, playing from the same. Uh, Dr. Shatirka, we might have. Uh, Dr. Sutita, I'm sorry for interruption. Uh, we might have lost you for a few moments there. Uh, last one. Can you, can you hear me? Now we can hear you and we cannot see the uh, presentation, please. Okay, I'll yeah. restart again. Sorry. Yeah. No problem. Sorry. Could Thank you? Uh... Yes, uh, we are able to see the presentation. You can I see now? We have to go to the presentation mode, yes. Yes. Uh, are you able to hear what I was saying in this slide? Uh, I think uh, this is where we uh, lost you, where yeah, we're speaking we about this. the lesser florican. Okay, fine. So basically, the current lesser florican population is largely in two um, subpopulations. One is in Ajmer, and, uh, which is in Rajasthan, um, close to where I'm uh, pointing the arrow, and another is in Bhavnagar. And in both these places, there are roughly about 100 uh, male territories during the breeding time. This was our assessment based on 2017. Now, um, in Ajmer, the birds are distributed over a much larger area, whereas in uh, Bhavnagar, they are packed within a very small grassland. And this hints on a very interesting feature of lesser floricon, which is their behavioral flexibility to these habitat changes. So lesser floricon typically um, uses these exploded lakes where uh, 
uh, males will be slightly separate from each other, about uh, two, three hundred meters distance from each other. They will form these territories where from they will uh, jump and they will display to attract the females. And this happens in grasslands. And uh, in, in such grasslands, you see very high densities of lesser florida. But as grasslands have been converted into agriculture, in some of these cases, like Shokalia, the lesser florida has been able to adapt to these changing agriculture. But over here, you will see that a much larger area is occupied, but at a very low density, like you can see in Ajmer over here, a much larger area where the birds are distributed, but then here the males are, the male territories are stretched apart from each other. So they are present at a very low density. And what it means is that, although you may conserve lesser florican in agricultural landscapes, you will require a thousand square kilometer of agricultural landscape to get the same conservation outcomes that less than a hundred square kilometer of a grassland can provide. So that is something which is, uh, which is um, uh, very uh, interesting and also insightful from conservation that yes, lesser Floridians do adapt to agricultural landscapes in some cases. We do not know the implications of that, uh, be it the pesticides or whatever, but to have densities as high as that, uh, a similar amount of densities uh, that are found in thousand square kilometers of agriculture area can practically be contained within a few hundred, uh, not even a few hundred, like 50 square kilometer of grassland, as you see in Yadavata. Now, I hope I'm still audible. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, now research uh, plays a very important role in uh, conservation and the current um, conservation approach uh, for busters are uh, largely use uh, uh, use research informed um, actions. Now, status surveys like the, like the ones I told before, they give a very broad picture of where the birds are, and you can sort of prioritize areas. You know, at large that okay, these are the areas where we have to implement our conservation measures and so on. But beyond that, they do not say much about the ecological needs of the species, and for that, we need to study their movement patterns. Their use of space with respect to seasonal resources, habitat characteristics, uh, their tolerance of disturbances, and so on. And it is very difficult to do these things for busters because they keep wandering off because they are large landscape species. However, telemetry, as uh, the advanced telemetry technology has given us this boost to study uh, exactly these things that are very meaningful for conservation because by studying how the birds are moving with respect to seasonal resources, habitat, and disturbances, you can inform conservation. You can, uh, you will know uh, what kind of measures need to be implemented, where they need to be implemented, so that the ecological requirements of the species are safeguarded. So, over the last few years, three years, we have captured two uh, and tagged two birds in Kutch, or four birds in uh, in um, uh, Thar, and. Uh, Two more birds in uh, Maharashtra was uh, attacked by uh, another team. So these uh, birds have given a lot of wealth of information on these species, which are uh, sort of hitherto unknown. Uh, so I will share a glimpse of their movement. Uh, you can see these are two tagged birds uh, in Thar. And you can see one of them in pink and one of them in blue. They are moving across this uh, large uh, landscape, and you can see um, how they are uh, restricted to these dark patches. These dark patches uh, are basically enclosures which are developed by Rajasthan Forest Department. They look dark because this is the only area where there is some vegetation in this otherwise barren and overgrazed uh, desert. And you can see how restricted the birds are uh, to these uh, to these enclosures for protection and for vegetation, which sort of validates the creation of these. Uh, areas. Uh, our birds in Kutch has given valuable information on their landscape use. You can see two birds over here, uh, one in yellow and another in green, and uh, against uh, power lines. Uh, you can see how this yellow bird, uh, bird is restricted to this area, which is basically the Nalia grassland and its adjoining Air Force area. These are the only uh, relatively large grasslands that are left, and it also showed that the birds tend to restrict itself to grasslands and only venture into agriculture when they do not have a choice. Now these, their movements against these power lines 
gave us this information on which power lines are the ones that are most crossed by the species that are most risky and it helped us in developing a sort of education priority for these uh, species um, uh, using this telemetry data one of the birds uh, the one in green it collided with one with these power lines that you can see over here this uh, three uh, lines of uh, overhead wires and it died um, and this created a lot of awareness in uh, terms of uh, in terms of the threat posed by power lines on uh, GIT. In fact, two of the five tagged birds, the other one in Maharashtra, has collided with power lines. And so this gave us this gave us the information. Power lines are probably a really important threat for the species. But to be able to develop a conservation plan, it is important to quantify the impact of threats, a series of threats, and prioritize them based on their magnitude of uh, impact. Uh, by doing this, we can target the most important threats and do not spend our valuable funds on threats that do not bring meaningful you know, uh, recovery of the species. So since we knew from other busters and also attacked uh, birds that power lines are an important trend, threat, we tried to quantify their impacts more on Great Indian Buster, but also the large area of species that they are associated with. Uh, this was done um, in Thar. You can see a map of uh, the power lines in Thar. These dark black lines are transmission lines. The gray lines are um, distribution lines. The green dots are wind turbines scattered all over. And the red ones are solar energy, solar power plants that we uh, map. Now, uh, we carried out surveys, carcass surveys, under these power lines, and we found uh, retinian clusters, uh, carcasses, but we also found about 289 carcasses of 30 species uh, during the surveys that we did. But, we found, but what you find under power lines is actually the tip of the iceberg, because many of these carcasses, they get decomposed and scavenged before even you, could, you can detect them. So we corrected for these biases by placing carcasses experimentally and monitoring how what proportion of them get decomposed, right? And when you incorporate these correction factors, what we found was there was about 10 birds that were dying per kilometer per month because of the transmission lines. And when you extrapolate that to the whole, to the 4,000 square kilometer uh, landscape that we were sampling, it turns out to be close to a lack of birds, uh, obviously not just GIB, uh, but uh, the throat of birds that were dying uh, because of this particular threat, which was uh, hitherto underestimated as an important conservation threat. However, there is a lot of literature across the world that shows that power lines are an important threat to birds, but uh, this was a real surprise uh, to us. And uh, if you, you can imagine that a lack of birds are dying per kilometer in an important conservation landscape, uh, it's a tremendous ecological loss because they would have otherwise contributed to a lot of ecosystem services. So certainly for Great Indian Buster, but also for a wide range of species, power lines uh, turn out to be a very important threat that we figured out from this research. Coming to the Great Indian Buster, uh, two out of five tags died because of power lines, and uh, we recorded four GIB deaths due to collision uh, in 2017, uh, two based on uh, our surveys and two based on um, other uh, opportunistic and uh, secondary information. And uh, it turns out to almost 15% of the population that is uh, being killed by top power lines. When you compare this to the, you know, to the population models that I showed, uh, you would understand that why this catastrophic decline is happening. You know, it's, it, uh, it can be a single source, single agent that can cause such now, information uh, flows into advocacy, and uh, we uh, disseminated this information through this report to decision makers. And we had, uh, we had held a series of uh, meetings uh, with power agencies. Uh, basically, uh, they were led by Rajasthan Police Department in following us, and we sat with them over multiple uh, sessions and tried to convince them of the importance of power line mitigation to conserve birds, conserve busters. And the recommended measures are, uh, they, we recommended a series of uh, measures based on the prior. So to disallow leaf lines and wind turbines and to underground existing lines in critical habitats and to mark semi-critical uh, power, uh, power lines, uh, um, power lines in semi-critical areas with diverters. So diverters are these uh, 
uh, structure or these uh, objects that you can place on the power line, which make the power lines more conspicuous. Uh, so we developed this uh, mitigation plan with consultation with uh, power agencies in Rajasthan and communicated it to Rajasthan government and also the central government, uh, where we selected, we prioritized a few lines based on this research on board surveys, telemetry, and so on, which needs to be mitigated um, urgently. And uh, currently, there are a lot of uh, legal uh, cases that are trying to find out a legislative solution uh, to this problem. Uh, now, we tested the durability of some of these reflect reflectors. So we procured about 100 reflectors and we uh, installed them in two segments. Um, and we are monitoring their, um, uh, their uh, condition uh, because these structures have never been uh, deployed in um, India and some of uh, we need to verify the quality of them. Some of them are working over the la uh, last two years and can be used, uh, uh, can be used to mitigate uh, this important threat in semi-critical areas. However, the effectiveness of these diverters are limited. Uh, it, has, uh, it can reduce mortality by uh, 25 to 75%, but it cannot eliminate mortality. And for that, the most important power lines need to be buried. And this, that is a uh, thing that needs to be done without which conservation of mustard cannot uh, move ahead. Now, in this backdrop of, uh, you know, uh, of uh, this path, there are some ways of hope. Uh, the enclosures that have been developed by Rajasthan Forest Department and also Gujarat Forest Department uh, in, uh, in Nalia, they have uh, resulted in a good recovery of vegetation. You can see in this map, this is a map of, uh, this is a figure uh, on the left hand side, there are enclosures, there is an enclosure and on the right hand side, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not an enclosure and you can see the difference in vegetation. And these habitats, these enclosures, they have started, uh, as I showed in the earlier, um, uh, tracking map also, they have become good habitat for uh, Great Indian Buster, uh, where that they prefer, particularly during the breeding season. We are working with the Rajasthan Forest Department and trying to design fences that are relatively creative proof. And this map, it shows uh, the movement of dogs and uh, fences that they can easily pass through uh, versus fences that can, they cannot. And uh, using this, uh, slowly and slowly, Rajasthan Forest Department is also trying to uh, trying to change, refine the their uh, fence um, fence structure so that uh, these uh, free ranging dogs and other predators can be kept away uh, from uh, the breeding habitats. Now, conservation breeding has been in has has been making rounds for a very long time for Great Indian Buster uh, as a conservation tool. It should not be used indiscriminately, but uh, only uh, in dire needs. For the Great Indian Buster, we are certainly running out of time. And uh, there was a lot of debate on whether conservation breeding should or not. If we implement conservation takes from the wild, then we may have uh, extinction of the species. Whereas, our understanding showed that if we do not do that, then the population was population was uh, surely heading towards extinction within the next uh, few decades. Uh, am I still audible? I just uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. We can. Okay. Yeah. So I just received a pop up that my internet is unstable, so I thought of crossing. Okay. So. Uh, and these, these were basically valid concerns and um, we were all um, uh, worried about whether to go for this or not. And then there was a national workshop that was held uh, in Delhi around 2015 uh, that uh, brought in a lot of uh, national and international experts. It was organized by MOFCC and WII. And uh, through this workshop, there was a consensus, a, a, a equivocal consensus that, yeah, yes, we should go ahead with conservation breeding because uh, without that, uh, the, the time that habitat restoration measures are taking to be implemented are so long, are so large because of the complex nature of buster uh, conservation that we may uh, lose the species by the time habitats are um, eventually restored. So therefore, we need to secure a captive population as insurance and meanwhile, buy time, basically that was the rationale of conservation breeding, to buy time uh, to 
restore the habitats. So with this objective, uh, uh, in July 2018, an agreement was signed between uh, Ministry of Environment, Forest, Climate Change, Rajasthan government, and Wildlife Minister of India um, to commence the conservation breeding program. Uh, and we roped in International Fund for Ubara Conservation, which is the leading um, expert in busted conservation um, on board. And uh, together, jointly, we developed this first uh, pilot facility that you can see in this, um, in this uh, figure, a uh, bird's eye view of the uh, conservation breeding facility that we developed in a place called Sam, which is uh, close to Desert National Park uh, near Jaisalmer. Uh, so this uh, is guarded by a predator-proof fence and has an incubation uh, unit. Uh, cages for uh, juvenile and adult birds, and it also we also produce uh, live organisms uh, like invertebrates and organic crops to feed our birds. So all these facilities are all these units are housed within this uh, small facility. Now within this, we are currently housing uh, ten uh, captive rare chicks of one of the rarest and most endangered species of the world. Now this entire process uh, it starts with. Uh, detailed observations of uh, the female birds from remote vantages using very powerful scopes through dawn and dusk by our uh, ecology team. They try to spot uh, females that are likely nesting. Uh, we can figure out that whether a female is nesting or not from their behavioral changes. They start visiting a certain point, uh, which is their nest, over and over again. And uh, once we have um, once we have suspected that there is a nest, we make one effort to go and try to find it on ground using a very small team, uh, Rajasthan Forest Department guards and um, staff and uh, frontline staff and uh, our team. And we collect this uh, in these uh, buffered boxes that you can see over here. After that, it is brought very slowly on a very slow moving vehicle to our facility at Sun, where they are incubated in these machines, which are called setters. So basically they can, uh, regulate the temperature and humidity uh, and provide an environment which, uh, which uh, the mother would have given. Uh, these eggs are routinely monitored uh, by an uh, array of techniques like handling and measuring their temperatures, taking their weights, by which we can figure out whether the development of the egg is on track or not. And after 21 days of uh, incubation, the egg hatches. You can see a chick hatching out of the egg. After it hatches, it is brought to a hatcher where it uh, dries up. It spends the first few hours of its life. And from there, it is then subsequently shifted to different uh, units, different uh, cages, and uh, through a completely, uh, through a different uh, approach of husbandry. Now, these are some of the glimpses of uh, activities uh, in the the science and art of uh, of being uh, a so this species has not been bred, bred in the wild i mean uh, bred early this is the first time it is uh, being done so we are developing on the template based on Bubara, which has been uh, owned, which has been fine tuned by our um, technical partners, the International Fund for Ubara Conservation, but we are constantly refining them and progressively moving towards uh, towards the correct um, approach uh, for uh, grating and buster. And this process is through careful experimental learning based on these templates where we, uh, where we introduce some intervention, we read whether the birds uh, respond to that based on their growth, their well-being and so on. And we modify, we refine that, um, uh, that intervention. Sukita, so, sir, uh, we are again. Sukita, so, sir, uh, so, it's breaking. Yes. Can you hear me or? Uh, I, think, I think it's a little better now. Uh, okay. We, yeah, it's better. Now. Yes. Yes. So, so in this, uh, currently, what we are trying to do is since the Great Indian Bustard has not been bred, uh, reared or bred um, scientifically in captivity earlier, we are trying to develop this approach of uh, rearing them. And uh, starting from the templates uh, of Kubara and other busters, which have been developed by our uh, technical partner, the International Fund for Kubara Conservation, but, uh, but uh, developing and refining further from them 
from that, from those templates through experimental learning, where we introduce a certain dimension. We read the bird's response to that in terms of their growth, their development, their well-being, and we slowly modify uh, this approach. And by this, we are refining each and every aspect, each and every detail of their husbandry, uh, starting from what we feed them, when we feed them, to how we house them, where we house them, and so on. So this is a very, um, very detailed uh, process, and we are uh, midway in it. Um, our we are having about 10 uh, captive bred, uh, captive uh, reared uh, chicks, which are basically being the first uh, lot to develop this husbandry approach. Uh, these will become our uh, founder stock, so they are uh, they are closely associated with the keepers. They are imprinted on the keepers. They are hand reared. Uh, and you can see um, about a year old bird over here in this tunnel like structure where we kept, keep the birds once they have uh, reached um, across the first uh, three, four months. And they have already reached about the adult uh, size, uh, as you can see from here. So this is, uh, this is the initial uh, step, an initial step of a very long process. Uh, where slowly we have to uh, then breed them and then uh, try to reproduce them. And at each step, these husbandry approaches need to be refined and rectified and uh, changed according to the needs and contexts. Now, this uh, conservation breeding, uh, the initial success of conservation uh, breeding, uh, actually, uh, has uh, given, has injected a shot of hope in the in the you know general backdrop of uh, despair uh, for busters, and uh, there was a large uh, team uh, involved. Uh, Dr. Jala, as you can see, our researchers, uh, husbandry technicians, uh, our partners in International Fund for Ubara Conservation, local youths whom we local people whom we employed in this and who are working very proficiently in this uh, in this program, uh, and the wise guidance of uh, the Chief Wildlife Warden, the uh, ADG Wildlife. Uh, the constant support of the local forest, uh, forest officers uh, and uh, this entire thing has uh, helped us in, uh, in slowly uh, taking up this very challenging uh, task. But while this has given us a glitter of hope, there is a lot that remains to be achieved and, uh, and we need to embark on these, these larger uh, activities of habitat restoration now. And this is something that requires a much larger to achieve this goal because, um, because the, the, the scale of uh, habitat restoration and the complexity of the matters are too large. So it requires a partnership, it requires a larger partnership and a larger constituency to, to achieve the habitat restoration uh, objectives so that the wild birds can be safeguarded and these ones, if they are reintroduced, uh, have a safe uh, So based on our understanding, ecological understanding of the species, we have recommended to secure 200 to 500 square kilometers of relatively contiguous habitat patches in each landscape that are free of detrimental infrastructure like power lines and also intensive land uses like excessive grazing or um, intensive agriculture and so on. Now the actions that are required to reach this uh, are firstly to mitigate power lines uh, by disallowing new lines and burying existing lines in critical areas, installing diverters in semi-critical areas. We have identified the priority and potential landscapes for both uh, Rajasthan and Gujarat and disseminated this information to ministries. Uh, the Ministry of Environment, Forest, Climate Change has also communicated these to the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy and Ministry of Power. And they have now issued directives to uh, the power agencies that they try to implement these mitigation measures whenever they are coming up with the new power line projects. And also to route train them through conservation organizations uh, for some sort of uh, impact assessment. However, the lines that are already existing they need to be mitigated, and that needs to be done uh, very, uh, very quickly. And there has been a little bit of inhibition on that, and inertia on that. But we must, uh, we must uh, take up this challenge as a combined, uh, as a combined fraternity, uh, to uh, because because uh, power lines must be mitigated if we are to conserve busters, and there is no other alternative to that. Secondly. 
to have breeding enclosures of about 10 square kilometers area, multiple of them within each of these um, uh, habitat patches, which are made predator proof and where habitat is managed. Uh, there's plenty of um, uh, research on habitat used by the species by uh, Dr. Asad Rahmani, um, our work based on observations and telemetry, and uh, many others, uh, which needs to be incorporated. Uh, these enclosures have a lot of predator, uh, predators, and also there are free ranging dogs, a flux of them in the adjoining uh, areas, and this is a big problem. So, transportation of uh, or rather management of uh, a holistic management of creators within enclosures and also this settlement uh, also this adjoining settlements is another uh, key action uh, that requires to be done uh, fourthly uh, busters can inhabit in compatibility with traditional land uses um, that, such as organic farms long fallow periods and uh, so on and these kind of practices can be uh, introduced in these habitats through incentives such as community fodder farms or organic farming. Uh, much of the Desert National Park is still farmed very organically. Um, however, community fodder farms can uh, gauge these critical drought periods when livestock requires um, fodder and they have to venture into the enclosure. So to give them an alternative to that, community fodder farms may work really well. And they can also give busters the required vegetation cover by excluding, by limiting livestock into uh, these uh, community-owned pastures. It requires organizations, uh, forest departments, and NGOs to work hand in hand with local communities and bring them on board. Uh, now, there are several organizations, there are some organizations that have started doing very, uh, very nice works on this direction, Corporate Foundation being one in Kutch, here is uh, in Rajasthan. Uh, and these need to be scaled up uh, and emulated at much scales. Uh, across the western landscapes uh, to uh, in order to create these relatively safe habitats and since busters require multi uh, use multi stake uh, stakeholder uh, landscapes which are owned by army uh, power agencies who have the real power to save the species it is important to carry out uh, outreach program for uh, to generate this public support and uh, as i mentioned there are several organizations that are now uh, starting up their works in buster landscapes, and uh, we need to we need to uh, complement each other's activities and try to uh, gauge these actions so that we can have we can secure these uh, habitat patches and safeguard the wild population and also create habitats for the birds to be to introduce the wild. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the dog sterilization program that we carried out with Human Society International. Uh, some uh, outreach programs that we have carried out over the years, but there are many organizations that are doing commendable work, uh, more uh, better work um, on this. Uh, the future of conservation in Bustard lies in uh, uh, in a combination of conservation breeding and habitat restoration measures. The initial success of conservation breeding, at least the husbandry part, has given us a hope, but it can it it is a very initial step in a long time and we complemented with, uh, with habitat restoration work, which requires a larger constituency of, uh, of buster conservationists, individuals and agencies working hand in hand, state forest departments, NGOs, researchers, research organizations working hand in hand to achieve uh, these goals uh, uh, that, that we discussed. So with this, uh, I would uh, like to end my talk. Uh, these are the, um, State Forest uh, Department and NGO partners uh, whom we work with uh, and uh, we hope to work with uh, in future also and um, we also strongly hope that uh, with our combined efforts we will be able to make some uh, tangible uh, changes in the in the fate uh, of these uh, iconic species which are the rallying points of grasslands and deserts. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Sufi, sir. That was indeed a, uh, indeed a pleasure listening to one of our favorite species of the country, I would say. So um, now we are open for questions and Umesh would be taking over the question and Q&A session. So Umesh, over to you, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Dr. Dutta, hi, this is Umesh. Uh, I will read out the questions for you that have come in through the chat and uh, you can take them up one by one. Yeah. Uh, just a moment. 
Okay, I first have a few questions from uh, Dr. AJT John Singh. Let me just take those up one by one. Uh, the first one, any progress with the efforts to take the power lines in critical mustard habitats underground? Please, can you uh, repeat the question? Uh, okay. Or guide me? I, I'll read it out again. Uh, yeah. Would you like me to read out all the questions and then you can... No, no, no that's okay. I can, I can see them in the chat. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, I'm just reading them out. Uh, because this was sent privately, so I'll just uh, read that out. Uh, any question, any progress with the efforts to take power lines in critical busted habitats underground? Any progress on the efforts? On the on the efforts to take the power lines underground. Right, there has not been, uh, there has been, uh, not uh, been any single case where power lines have been undergrounded so far. Uh, this has just been recommended and recommended over time and currently uh, uh, the National Green Tribunal and the Honorable Supreme Court have two cases uh, that are currently um, ongoing, uh, which are looking into the matter. Uh, also, uh, as uh, directed by some of these cases, the Ministry of Environment, Forest, Climate Change have brought power agencies on board uh, to develop a time-bound action plan for implementing these measures. But currently, till now, no, but no power line has been undergrounded so far. The technology uh, of undergrounding is uh, actually undergrounding power lines is feasible for less than 66 kV lines. Beyond that, it becomes difficult to technologically and also economically, it becomes very difficult to bury long stretches of power lines. So uh, that is uh, that is one um, one problem. However, critically small stretches like a few kilometers can still be done and. Uh, there is one case uh, by an agency called Spring Energy uh, in uh, Lesser Florican area in Madhya Pradesh, I think Sardarpur, Sardarpur, where they have undergrounded a small segment of power line, uh, which was uh, coming inside the sanctuary. Thank you. Okay, the next question uh, is, uh, what is the number in Kutch now? In spite of excellent knowledge, water holes and water towers are being developed in Karnataka area. Uh, is it clear? Would you uh, like to uh, repeat again? Can I just can I just take that question? Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there are several issues here. I think I don't know who has asked this question, but it's very crucial. This is Dr. Uh, Ajit Johnson. Yeah, Dr. Johnson. I think it's all for all to hear that um, most of the wildlife numbers that we report are highly fudged, and that's a major problem with uh, reporting in our country because in Kutch, you know, when we knew there were about fifteen bustards left. The Gujarat government reported 45 birds. It's not that the officers didn't know that there were 15 birds left, but just to save our skin, uh, we report wrong numbers. And if you take, if you do not take cognizance of a problem, there is no way you can address it. And that that uh, situation has uh, been in the past for tigers as well. We had 3,500 tigers in this country, and today at that point in time, we had just around 1,500. So, uh, unless unless uh, the department and the government of India takes cognizance of reporting correct uh, information, it is very difficult to do conservation. And bustards have been um, a major concern, and Gujarat especially. We knew the birds were declining. Uh, Dr. Datta was doing his PhD at that time in Kutch, and we knew there were about 15, 20 birds left, but the official record was about 40, 45, um, at times even 60 birds. So, and, and in such cases, it's a major concern. Today, there are five birds left in Kutch. I think Devesh can uh, chip in there and talk about it. But that's, that's what the reason is. So despite all these efforts, which Dr. Datta talked about, what are we going to do with these uh, conservation bred birds if we do not have places to reintroduce them? And that's where the last slide of what he talked about, we need to take action now to secure sites within the Bustard's historical range and ensure that there are patches devoid of power lines. We have, if we don't do that, all these efforts are of no use, you know, they are in vain. And um, that's, I think, the crux of the whole thing. Conservation breeding, as soon as we start breeding birds, I think we'll go into a complacency mode, thinking that we have saved the species. But the species is only there in captivity. It cannot go in the wild unless we have these habitat patches restored. And that's, I think, the crux of busted conservation. Public pressure needs to be put on to the government. The court cases which have been filed need to be coming to a logical end with uh, Dr. Ranjit Singh fighting a court case in the Supreme Court. 
We have a court, a high court case in um, Jodhpur, and the Green Tribunal has taken cognizance of this. So I think that's uh, answers some of the questions which uh, have been raised. Right, sir. Actually, there were a couple of uh, follow-up uh, questions which you kind of touched on. One was, are there any males among the population in Kutch? And uh, the other thing was, uh, uh, I was told someone is going to Supreme Court to get rid of free-ranging dogs. Is there any progress on this? Um, currently, there is uh, in, uh, in Kutch, uh, no breeding male, but um, well, actually, for these species, uh, you should never leave hope, uh, lose hope because uh, they are landscape level species, and there may be birds, uh, males in the vicinity, which can, which can, uh, you know, uh, eventually uh, return to the lake. Uh, so these habitats need to be conserved uh, to risk, to to retain the breeding potential of the species. Uh, the second uh, question I think was about the dogs. Yes, about Supreme. the Supreme Court cases against the free-ranging dogs. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can you can you just yeah can you just clue okay. me in about this? Yeah, the, uh, the question is: uh, I was yeah. told someone is going to Supreme Court to get rid of free-ranging dogs. Is there any progress on this? No. Uh, but Dr. Jala, if you can. Chip uh, in. Dr. Jala, you have to unmute yourself, please. There is a proposal for a court case in the Supreme Court. It's not yet been filed. Um, but, you know, the legal system today prohibits you from killing dogs. The best you can do is sterilize them. Sterilize them and what? Release them back in the wild where they were caught from. And that uh, is what uh, most organizations like HSI or somebody who's going to sponsor this whole huge program of sterilization would believe in. However, if you were to leave the dogs there, they're going to live a natural life of at least another eight to 10 years. And the havoc that they're going to do to wildlife is going to continue. So we need to really look at our policy. Um, um, conservation for uh, animal rights activists is, it's, I mean, conservation and animal activism doesn't go hand in hand always. I mean, we all love cats and dogs, but there are places where they just cannot be. And one has to take cognizance of that if you were to save our endangered species. And we need to eradicate these animals from them. Humane ways to either euthanize them or to capture and translocate them. Uh, and have shelters. If people love dogs and cats, keep them in the homes. Not free-ranging. They are not supposed to be free-ranging. Thank you. Okay, the next question is from Devi Karani. Uh, appreciate the details of conservation and success. My question is, can the eggs be artificially fertilized to increase survival? Possibly a few birds could be uh, conserved in sanctuaries across India. And uh, solar power alternatives can also be recommended with incentives. Hmm. Can the eggs be um, artificially fertilized? Probably they uh, can be in much future, but currently we do not have the technology or um, know how among the bustard uh, conservation breeders about uh, uh, but artificial insemination of, um, of uh, eggs becomes a possibility once uh, the birds that we have in our captivity, they, uh, they become sexually mature. In the wild, they become sexually mature in about uh, four to five years. We do not know when um, when will, uh, they will become mature in the captivity. Uh, but once that is done, then they, then uh, semen can be collected from uh, males, and uh, females can be artificially increase their uh, increase their clutching and increase the number of eggs that we can produce from a single female. So that remains uh, possible. And it has been done successfully in Hubara, so uh, we hope uh, that we uh, we will be able to do it. But it's a long way from now. Right. Actually, uh, Dr. Jala also did add uh, uh, a comment on the chat. He says uh, artificial fertilization enhances recruitment and conservation breeding programs. But Dr. Jala, would you like to you know just uh, elaborate on this? Or? Dr. Jala, would you like to elaborate? Yes, no, no. As, as Dr. Datta mentioned, yes, artificial uh, fertilization is, can be done in conservation breeding programs, but it is a, not a solution to the wild, you know. And um, as you know, that um, there's a huge dimorphism in the bird. The males are much larger. They have a different survival strategy. And as it appears, they are 
uh, they are uh, influenced by higher mortality factors compared to females. So if you look at Kutch, if you look at uh, Rolapadu, um, even in Jaisalmer, the birds seem to be uh, the male birds seem to be the limiting factor in the population. In most other species, it's the female sex which is the limiting. You know, you have enough males to fertilize them. But in bustards, it seems to be that uh, the male gender and just because of their morphology and their uh, life history traits, they are likely to fall uh, victims to power lines and to predation much more than the females are. So um, the, we need to be very careful with the male bustards and they are prized possessions wherever they, they are still surviving. And it takes a long time for a male to reach a breeding status, you know, and it's, um, it's only the territorial uh, lacking bird which will actually do the fertilization for the females. So juvenile males or sub-adult males or males which cannot hold territories in a lek are unlikely to breed and they are sort of, you know, uh, surplus in the population. So males are crucial for busted um, survival. Right. Thank you. Okay. The next question is from JVD Murthy. Uh, is this captive breeding program possible at other sites as well? And is Lacos involved in the conservation program? Uh, for Great Indian Bustard, uh, it is very difficult to, uh, to uh, try these in separate states, if you're asking that. Because no other population apart from Thar has uh, the potential to sustain a captive uh, population by itself. The number of individuals are so less that we cannot uh, have a self-sustaining founder population from wild lakes collected from any other landscape. But it is really important to, for all the populations to contribute to this central and national, this is a national conservation breeding program. It is not uh, only of Rajasthan. It is actually um, a national program and in the true spirit, the different populations of Great Indian Buster uh, need to be incorporated at some stage uh, in this because uh, as per our genetic uh, investigations show that Rajasthan has the largest genetic diversity and a good representation of genetic signature. However, there are some private alleles and private, uh, you know, uh, unique genetic signatures in, um, in Lekkan and also in Gujarat. And uh, we need to figure out a way at a later stage to have representation from this population. We do not know exactly how, I mean, clearly how to gauge that uh, issue, but it is something that uh, needs to be done. However, these individual populations can, cannot have their own, um, own uh, captive, bred, um, uh, program, captive breeding programs because of the sheer small uh, number of wild birds. Uh, which cannot sustain a collection outside of Chesterfield. Lacons is uh, not involved in this uh, particular um, uh, particular uh, initiative. Okay. Yeah. okay, now a question from Prakash. What are the other species that are found dead uh, near the power lines during your service? All sorts of birds. We found uh, at least 30 species of birds, uh, but uh, our research shows that generally birds that are larger in size have larger wingspan and uh, they are the ones which are uh, most susceptible. Uh, so bustards, cranes, um, yeah, many raptors, uh, but a very wide range of uh, taxa are affected by this. Threat. Many of them uh, particularly the raptors, they often perch on the power lines to uh, for hunting and also for nesting, and they get electrocuted. Electrocution is not a problem for Great Indian Buster. Uh, collision is a problem. So electrocution is when a bird sits on the power line and it uh, connects the two conductors and gets fried basically. Uh, whereas uh, this is a problem with raptors and many other perching. Uh, I mean, many other birds that perch on the power lines or on the pylons. But uh, with bird, uh, busters, they generally fly into the wires and uh, collide. Right. Okay. Uh, next question from JVD Murthy. How receptive is the local community to the changes they have to make for the conservation of the GA? Um, so, it's a, it's a very mixed uh, kind of bag. In some uh, areas, we are seeing a uh, a very positive um, attitude towards uh, Great Indian Buster conservation. Uh, at least I would say in the uh, in Jaisalmer, in many areas, uh, we 
we get very positive uh, feedback and particularly after the commencement of the conservation breeding program about uh, because uh, these people see that there's some some something tangible has uh, also been done uh, there are many places um, towards uh, towards eastern uh, side of jaisalmer where there are a lot of local communities local people uh, who are coming up uh, very strongly for uh, great indian mustard conservation they have also formed Uh, local communities um, and uh, they are they have become very active voices of uh, mustard conservation on the other hand we also have uh, cases uh, and uh, areas where uh, still that uh, that antagonism um, exists and some of it exists because uh, these people have been uh, have been kept aside from the uh, from the benefits that uh, they think they should get like uh, like roads electricity these are things that are required for livelihoods and there cannot be any debate on that but the issue is that once you have roads and overhead power lines and water uh, availability the landscape starts changing so it's it's a it's a matter of you know it's a matter of uh, great concern as to how to provide these things and yet ensure that the landscapes do not change it's not a easy solution and uh, in the uh, absence of uh, these uh, basic amenities in some areas uh, uh, the antagonism of local people do exist um, however uh, at least in jaisalmer uh, we are seeing a change and there is a positive change in the attitude towards mustard conservation so it is complicated okay uh, next question from gitanjali is there any way to entice the mustards to the breeding areas to make them feel safe and let them breed in safety yeah so mustards are very traditional to their uh, breeding areas um, and the loss of a displaying arena or the lake or the loss of the nesting sites that is the prime uh, threat to these uh, species now it is um, very difficult to recreate um, these display arenas and uh, nesting sites but the ones that are existing if they are given some bit of protection and you know by by creating an enclosures then mustards uh, by themselves they uh, they reach their i mean they get enticed i mean uh, it's it's uh, it's very easy to entice uh, you do not actually have to entice they get attracted uh, to their traditional areas if they're given some bit of protection and this uh, we have seen in jaisalmer um, and kutch and almost uh, in the other place right so the conditions are favorable they do tend to yeah if the conditions are favorable uh, in their traditional breeding areas they will uh, they will always um, come to those areas uh, so in uh, desert national park the breeding enclosures they are the places where you find uh, a lot of nests a lot of display activities and the birds they might be you know using a larger area for non breeding activities but they will use these protected enclosures for breeding they do get get enticed by these areas and also they have a very strong hardwired traditionality i i'll just add uh, was uh, one more thing to what yes. dr datta mentioned is that these long lived birds are have their culture of their own they are culturally influenced in what happens and they learn this culture so traditional lekking areas are where bustards will actually breed if you lose this lek the area where the males are displaying then you lose an entire breeding population it's very rarely that new leks are formed you know that this is something which has to be learned by youngsters or where they should go and lek the young birds observe the older ones and their older generation and learn from there so the tradition in long lived birds is is a culture and uh, we are just skimming the surface of understanding the behavioral ecology of these birds and that's not even considered when you have such low populations but they might be playing a very significant factor on the long term conservation of many of these species which we know so little about right right that makes a lot of sense thank you uh, okay the next uh, question is from cs devadas uh, which year was the peak population of gibs noticed and where was it one minute repeat that uh i didn't get it uh, which year which year was the peak population of gibs noticed and where was it 
uh, GIBs are on a constant constant decline. There is no the peak year is long way back, so they are on a steady decline. In Jaisalmer, the decline uh, is um, relatively less uh, compared to the other uh, areas. For example, uh, in uh, Maharashtra in Sholapur, the population uh, in and around Nanaj had declined from something like um, 30 to 40 birds uh, to just about one or two birds over a span of 10 years. Uh, in Kutch, the population has declined from um, uh, from about 25 birds to just about five birds within a matter of 10 years. Uh, in Jaisalmer, it's a little less steep, but clustered populations are declining all over. And it's probably more or less the same story at Rolapad also. Okay. Uh, the next question is from JVD Murthy. Uh, at what age are they released from their uh, birthplace, that is in the breeding program, let's say, into the wild? Well, we are far from that uh, stage. We just have, uh, we have started this program uh, last year and uh, generally uh, bustards uh, become sexually mature at about three to four years in the wild. We do not know when it's going to happen in uh, captivity. But um, once that happens, we have to ensure that the captive population develops. And once it has reached a self-sustaining uh, stock size, then we can start releasing. However, but, uh, if you are concerned about the age of the bird when it is released, generally, busted uh, conservation breeders prefer to release birds as juveniles. Uh, typically, um, more than uh, four or five months, uh, about six months, but less than a year. Because uh, once the birds are more than, a, uh, these birds basically they grow really fast as, uh, as juveniles. Uh, within the first six, seven months, they attain uh, adult body size. Uh, and also the predation rate in the wild is highest within the first three months of a juvenile's life. So birds are typically released after six months and before one or two years so that they have the mental flexibility to uh, you know, to adjust to the wild, uh, and are also they have become adult size. They are out of the peak predation zone, but they are still quite young to uh, sort of blend and learn. Uh, the, the reintroduction is a critical time when um, you know they, they need to uh, they need to learn from birds in the wild, and uh, that is also something which is very important. That there should be birds in the wild from where they can learn. Okay, another question from Kitanjali. Is the government receptive to these ideas? Uh, she has a comment. I remember one CM saying that there is no time to save humans and you want to save the animals. Yeah, it's a very mixed, uh, again, a very mixed uh, thing. Uh, some gov sometimes uh, government is quite receptive, uh, sometimes uh, not so much. Um, Dr. Jala, would you like to uh, enlighten us on that? I actually didn't get the question. Are governments receptive to these ideas? Of? To, to these ideas of busted conservation. I think they're particularly mentioning about the power line mitigation. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah well, yeah, thanks for up, I think. Okay. Can I request anybody else to switch off the mics, please? I have, I have turned it off. I'm giving uh, you yes, Dr. Jala, please go ahead. Yeah, I think the governments are receptive, but there are two parts of the government. One which looks at developmental projects, of course, which gets far more weightage than the conservation part. So there is very good lip service and um, uh, everybody wants to have a green governance. So in Gujarat, uh, when uh, uh, our honorable prime minister was the chief minister there, he was sensitized about busted conservation. And uh, he was very keen to transfer the land, which was uh, available as a sheep farm there. And, but unfortunately, he became the prime minister subsequently. And the subsequent chief minister who was there um, was, I mean, the, I, I was told that uh, she said five hectares of land for five birds. I think, are, are, you talking about, are you talking about a ridiculous proposition here? So that's the kind of um, uh, political will sometimes that we find. We also find some very high level political will. Um, but in the case of bustards, it's a, it's a, a hot and cold um, blowing thing. The costs involved for conserving bustards are phenomenally high. 
um, the busted arc which Dr. Datta showed, uh, it's a huge area of about uh, 6,000 square kilometers or about. I, Dr. Datta can uh, rectify the figure there, I don't have it in my mind. But imagine freezing that for development. Um, we're not saying that you don't do any kind of development, but any kind of power sector development is not possible in that area with bustards. So we need, the society needs to take a stand on that and say what we want. Do we want bustards at all in our country? If that's the case, we have to forego this short-sighted power development with overhead cables. It's not that we are, um, uh, you can do all kinds of power sector development. You can put solar farms there if you wish, but as long as the power lines are underground, it's possible to do that. Windmills are a no-no. And I don't think the Rajasthan government is looking at this very favorably. I think our only hope is the court cases, uh, which are there in the Supreme Court and in the High Court. And hopefully if the court forces this down the throat of development, only then will we have bustards left in our landscape. Otherwise, I don't see much hope of them being conserved. Perfect. Okay, the next question from uh, Devi Murthy is, is there any imprinting on the bustard chicks? Yeah, so the initial stock, uh, that we are uh, developing, it is, uh, they are uh, very closely associated with the keepers. And we uh, intend to be uh, that way because uh, it gives us an opportunity to uh, do artificial insemination also. You cannot, uh, I mean, you cannot have birds around you that are always stressed um, by seeing humans, if that is the case, they are not going to they are not going to breed. So the initial uh, stock uh, needs to be uh, imprinted to an extent that they accept keepers as you know one of their own kinds, or at least they know that they are not of their own kinds. But we still tolerate them enough that we breed on our own and also uh, you know through artificial insemination. However, once we are at the stage when we are thinking of reintroduction, there the busted cheeks need to be reared in a completely different protocol uh, where there is not so much of imprinting that uh, hinders their survival in the wild after release. So we are going to change gears when we come to that stage. Right. So uh, a question from just Ashok. Just one moment, Umesh. We have, uh, we have three participants who have raised hands. Uh, we'll just finish the chat questions and then, and then we will uh, take on uh, the direct ones, please. Let us uh, finish the chat question first. Umesh, is that okay for you? Yes, yes, that's fine. Yeah, thanks. Okay, the next question is uh, from Ashok. Uh, other than uh, sterilization of the dogs, are there any other measures taken to the dog management program to control predation? You could touch upon this. Is there anything you should like to add? Yeah, other than uh, sterilization. So, um, the dogs that venture into the uh, enclosures are basically removed from the enclosures. And however, the uh, villages that are around the uh, around these areas, these bustard habitats, they are reserve dogs, and uh, they have a very large uh, population of dogs, 800, 800 dogs uh, in the 20 villages that are in the prime Great Indian bustard habitat in Jaisalmer. Um, and uh, we could only do a sterilization program on them because, as Dr. Jhala said. Currently, our legal, um, you know, uh, option is only to sterilize, and it is, uh, it is, a, it is a very short-sighted uh, approach because uh, by sterilizing, you are unable to manage the dog population, and it has been shown uh, in multiple cases. Unless and until you continue sterilization for years together, it is not a one-time solution. You have to continue sterilizing from uh, years together, and then there can be some reduction in dog population. But the ones that are staying are going back into the enclosures or the bustard habitats, and they're still, I mean, more than bustards, chinkara, which is an associated, you know, um, antidote, they are at a greater danger. And we estimate a very high um, predation rate of chinkaras by dog. Um, so, yeah, I mean, currently our uh, policies are not uh, adequate to uh, control the dog problem. It's almost intractable. While we try to sterilize to get some, uh, you know, um, some good conservation done, it's not adequate. Uh, I, I would like to just add one thing. I think um, uh, in our discussion, we have not mentioned one very key person who is responsible for busted conservation, as then that has been Dr. Asad Rahmani. And it is uh, through his efforts uh, before 
I, either when Dr. Datta, myself, or DC got into the whole idea of busted conservation, he has been leading the fight for busted conservation for a very, very long time. Done the best is spent half his career uh, in trying to do that. So I would like to pay my tribute to Dr. Rahmani and bringing the plight of the species to the world. And that's, I think it's very important to acknowledge that. Thank you, sir. Well done, sir. Well said. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next uh, question. A uh, question from uh, Shravan. Uh, well, again, you've uh, touched upon this. How did the power sector receive the recommended alternatives for the conservation of species? You did mention resistance. Uh, anything else you'd like well, to I mean, uh, sometimes, sometimes power agencies, um, they, they are quite receptive. Uh, the problem is uh, that uh, the projects that have already been used implemented, uh, they have not budgeted uh, diverters or budding costs, uh, undergrounding costs at the time of the project. So they also have a sort of, you know, limitation in that. So then they look forward to government to give them, um, uh, you know, subsidies or give them some sort of funds to do that in a retrospective manner. And uh, that is where uh, the problems have started. Uh, that uh, these these additional funds to mitigate um, existing power lines are uh, not available. Uh, but anyway, I mean, uh, there are uh, cases where power agencies are quite receptive and we, ever since these uh, concerns have been raised, uh, we get um, a series of, uh, you know, uh, calls from power agencies uh, basically asking that, okay, is this, uh, is this a, a safe area to have our uh, power projects or should we stay away? Uh, from these areas, uh, given the concern for the birds and given the legal issues and so on. So, yeah, there, uh, there is a positive response from power agencies, but also this, this inhibition of undergrounding or, you know, installing, uh, partly because it involves a lot of financial costs and, you know, they are not so much interested. The new power lines that are coming up in many of these cases are coming with these, uh, with the, with these diverters. Uh, which is a good thing, but it is not fair enough. Right. right. There is a related uh, comment from Mr. Kandi. He says, uh, Ahmedabad city, there is a, quite a long power line, more than 11 kilo, uh, kilo volts, which is underground. Yeah, in many places, uh, power lines have been made underground, and uh, up to 66 kV of power lines have been undergrounded uh, on uh, several occasions. Apart from this case in Ahmedabad, there are um, Flamingo habitats uh, in uh, Kutch, where power lines have been undergrounded. So it is not something that is um, unprecedented. So there are examples of it before. It just requires the public, uh, I mean, the political will and uh, you know the the societal stand that this needs to be done. Uh, the other consequence is that I mean we need to make the choice that whether we have we want a, a country. I mean we want a world without bustards or we are. Uh, going to forego this additional, you know, project uh, power, uh, power development um, at the cost of Okay, so um, do we have five minutes? Yes, yes. Yeah, we do have time. So then what I'll do is I'll, I'll show you the conservation breeding uh, film on the center. So that might be, you can see it live, what's happening there and how these guys are actually managing it. Oh, that will be great. Thank you. Okay, so how do I? Any uh, you share? can uh, you can share your screen, sir. The green button, yeah, center sure. of the screen. Yeah, sure. Just for the information of others, we'll come back to the questions of the video. Can you see it? Uh, uh, no, 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 sir. You can see the cold or not? Uh, Is it visible? No, it, it isn't visible. Uh, I think yeah. you need to share the uh, video. The screen which you're sharing has there to be you have to share it. Your particular window, sir. Yeah, I'm sharing that screen. It seems carrying here. Okay, I'll do it again. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, it has started screen sharing. Bustards are one of the heaviest flying birds, and they have no frontal vision. So when they fly, they do not expect barriers in the sky. And the modern power lines cause most of their deaths. As you can see, the bustard here has collided with the power line emanating from the windmills, which are the source of green energy 
Considering the declining population of the Great Indian Bustard, the Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change mandated the Wildlife Minister of India to commence a conservation breeding program as an insurance against total extinction of the bustard in the wild. We are going to take you through the conservation breeding facility set up at SAM in the Desert National Park, a collaboration between the government of Rajasthan and the Wildlife Minister of India, and a temporary facility has a setup been set up at the SAM dunes. The old guard quarters at SAM were transformed into a conservation breeding center with the help of the International Fund for Hobara Conservation. Scientists from IFHC Abu Dhabi helped us in designing it and setting the conservation center up at SAM. The facility here includes an incubator for incubating eggs which are secured from the wild. Subsequently, there's a hatchery in which the, uh, the newborn chicks are kept, fed up to the age of about, about a year. The life feed is also maintained here. They are totally predator proof. Rodents or other carnivores like dogs and foxes cannot access the eggs or the chicks and we can rear them with utmost security. The process commences with the location of breeding females that are nesting. And this requires a lot of field effort. Our field teams are well equipped. We had trained experts from IFXC who assisted our teams in locating females on nests. The regular movement of females within a localized area and a center homing place allows us to determine whether the female is nesting or is just wandering around on our foraging trips. So our team was able to locate several nests and with the permission of the government of Rajasthan, we were able to secure nine eggs this season and put them in the incubator for hatching. We have almost had 100% success rate till now and there are seven chicks which are born and reared in the conservation breeding sector at SUM. Once the egg is collected, it is cleaned and weighed. The transportation from the nest site to the center is done in a vehicle in a chamber, which does not allow any jerks to be given to the egg. Uh, once the egg is at the center, it is cleaned uh, antiseptically, then it is weighed and it is scanned to find out the stage of development of the embryo. Uh, after that, it is put in an incubator. The incubator is maintained at a constant temperature and humidity in such a manner that the egg loses moisture at a predetermined rate, uh, which is set for the Arabian Bustard Standards by the International Fund for Hobara Foundation, who have been breeding these bustards for the last 20 years. Once the chick is ready to hatch, um, it starts ripping, and um, you can hear the sounds as well as the movement of the eggs, and it is moved to a different chamber allowing it to hatch. It takes anywhere from a few hours to almost a day for the chick to actually emerge when the shell is spipped. And the chick is hatched, it is left into a brooder, allowing it to um, get over the strain of uh, hatching and uh, subsequently move to the hatchery where it is fed uh, with live feed as well as uh, staples which are developed for the Hobara Bustard with a high protein diet, so its growth rate is maintained at the best um, optimal standards. Regularly, the chick is weighed and its uh, growth parameters recorded. And uh, if it falls below or above the growth chart, then its diet is adjusted accordingly. For exercise, the chicks are allowed into a small uh, uh, open uh, sand pit where uh, till the age of about a week or so, they exercise themselves and subsequently they're taken out since most of these birds are uh, long distance walkers, they need a lot of exercise for the limbs to develop well. And they're totally imprinted with humans since uh, this is the uh, bonding population which will remain in captivity for their lifetimes and be used for breeding uh, purposes only. And the more habituated they are to humans, the easier it is to handle them for vaccination, for medication, for artificial insemination, or for extraction of sperm. And uh, uh, the process of habituation is by massaging the birds on a regular basis, getting them trained to human presence and human handling. And they imprint on humans quite easily, as you can see in some of these videos, the birds walking around with human beings, as well as allowing close approach and handling. This is just the first mile in a 100 mile race for um, uh, conservation breeding program. And we have started with a very good uh, success rate, but there are miles to go before we reach success because it will depend on how well these ch uh, chicks grow up, whether they breed in captivity, and once they breed, whether we are able to rehabilitate the second generation.
born out of these chicks and train them to live back in the wild. So it's a long drawn process and uh, we have to go in for a long haul uh, considering the project uh, to last for anywhere between 20 to 25 years. That's, that's absolutely an amazing video and thank you sir. I think we learned a lot from that video. <laughs> thank you very much for showing this to us. Uh, but one, one observation, I keen observation, Dr. Sutita sir, uh, are you inside that lab where it is being read now? Yeah, yes. <laughs> because I, that location seemed familiar. So just wanted to check with you. Okay. Now, yeah, oh my, she can, she can proceed. Okay, so let's get back to the questions now. A uh, question from K. Nair. As a lay person, I wasn't aware that these birds are so critically endangered. Is there any way to get more people, students involved? Can you do an outreach program beginning with zoology students? Yes, um, surely. I mean, we do have some outreach programs, but <clears throat> there are many other organizations uh, like the BNHS, uh, um, Corbett Foundation, uh, WWF, uh, ERDS Foundation, who are doing uh, a larger <clears throat> outreach activities of this sort. Uh, I remember uh, Dr. Amani, as uh, Dr. Shala was mentioning, he's, he was the one who has been fighting for busters for very long, and he had uh, these um, long uh, processions in uh, various cities, in uh, towns in Jaisalmer, trying to uh, create awareness among the uh, local students and local people. He was doing that back in 1980s and 90s, I think, 90s. <coughs> Since then, uh, several outreach uh, programs have been conducted by these different organizations, but it's always uh, too less. And uh, there is always opportunity to do more. And uh, yeah, I mean, we we'll look forward to such uh, such opportunities and look forward to such suggestions also to uh, sensitize more uh, children and uh, the larger public in doing that. Yeah. I'll take it as a more of a suggestion. Okay. A question from Gitanjali: Can the buskers known in such conservation areas manage outside of their own? Hello, Go ahead, Amish. Can you ask that again? Uh, okay, I'm repeating that question. Can the bustards grown in such conservation areas manage outside on their own? Uh, you mean conservation areas as in wild conservation areas? Breeding wild? Birds, grown Breeding in the You mean uh, the, the birds that are being uh, produced in the conservation breeding program, whether they will be able to adjust in the wild? Uh, yes, that's what I understand from the question. Uh, yeah. Gitanjali, are you around? Would you like to uh, elaborate on this? I think she has left. No, she has left. Okay, I, okay. Think yeah. I think she is talking about the conservation. The question uh, is yeah, yeah, okay, it's a it's a million dollar question. And it's not yet there, right? Uh, so. the, answer, the answer can only be given uh, once we start uh, reintroducing. But uh, there are... Uh, there are a lot of concerns on this uh, particular aspect because uh, bustards are a kind of species where the chicks, they learn uh, how to live from their mothers and from association with other birds. Uh, so if many of these learnings are culturally transmitted. However, when we are rearing these birds, we figure out that some of these, uh, some of these things are very innate in them. For example, uh, nobody needs to show them a particular prey. From the moment they see a particular insect which they have never seen before, they know it's a prey and they will go and uh, attack <coughs> them. Uh, same with lizards and all the other kinds. So from food, identifying food, it's very innate in them. So there are certain uh, requirements uh, of their requirements which are very innate but there can be some others which are culturally transmitted like finding um, uh, habitats or finding uh, breeding areas and so on and uh, it will obviously be uh, it is obviously uh, a challenging task to uh, for these birds to manage in the wild but it has been found that when they're released uh, in a soft uh, release uh, mode and also where other wild birds were existing from where they can uh, learn, then the chances are relatively high. Um, the International Fund for Hubara Conservation, they release um, many uh, captive bred uh, hubaras. There are many other programs that also release them. 
and they have a success or rather a survival probability which is slightly lower than the lower than the white one but still it is not uh, very less so yeah and we have to figure out how good they are adapting when uh, we come to that point but uh, yeah there is hope right right okay a uh, question from samakshi could you talk about how many eggs have been collected from the wild and what percentage of them hatched i can only talk about the last uh, season um, because the current season is still ongoing and uh, we uh, cannot say as yet uh, in the last season we collected uh, 10 eggs and out of them nine hatched and all nine are uh, currently uh, they are all uh, nearly one year old now um, yes excellent okay what is the target captive population this is a question from amanda a population that can sustain itself from uh, you know uh, demographic randomness um, is about uh, 30 individuals so with approximately 20 to 25 uh, females and about 5 uh, to 10 males uh, but uh, once we have about um, at least about 20 25 individuals we can um, we can be a little more assured otherwise what happens is that there is a lot of randomness that happens it's something like that uh, that if you are uh, tossing a coin only five uh, two three times there is a high chance that you will get all heads if you are tossing it 100 times there is a very high chance that you will just get exactly 50 times heads and 50 times tails so uh, in terms of demographic randomness it means that uh, when you have a small population be it captive or wild the chance of getting all females or all males in a particular batch is very high or the chance of getting i mean remains high or the chance of all self, all failing uh, remains you know uh, quite high so there can be just one particular uh, event a catastrophic event when all the pop, all the individuals you know um, die so to buffer your population be it wild or be it captive from such kind of demographic randomness you need a larger uh, numbers as a rule of thumb as a ballpark it is more than 25 okay uh, this is a question from david mohan is there any movement by the floridians between sokalia and nevada so that's been answered omesh it has been answered i know but uh, you know uh, for the benefit of people who haven't uh, gone through the chat okay you just read out the answer because it's already there Right. Uh, okay, so what Dr. Jala said is uh, just commenced a satellite study over the lesser floridian movement patterns are poorly known. Nor do we know if the floridian population is shared between uh, which is another other and so on. Yeah, there there are others who are asking you, and I think BC also had a question and uh, a couple of others as well. So from the same. Yeah, just leave me out of it for the moment. Dr. Dr. Jala has answered my questions. All right, fine. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm just moving down to uh, chat. Let me see what other questions are there. Uh, okay, uh, Nishant has mentioned something. Doctor Datta, can you please reiterate the point of no stage, no stake stage competition comparison regarding the one percent? Uh, Nishant, yeah, would you like to repeat that? Uh, yeah, please. I couldn't catch the question. Okay, uh, Nishant Kumar has mentioned. Doctor Datta, can you please reiterate the point of no state stage competition stroke comparison regarding having their own facility you made a passing remark on the same yeah i think i answered that question uh, so there i i nishant's question i have answered uh, i i think he was confused um, see the reason is that we what sutit mentioned was that we cannot have other conservation breeding centers not okay. just stage but states right. we do not want separate states to have separate centers and the reason is that there is only one source population today and that's rajasthan and uh, taking eggs from the source population is a problem for the survival of the source we are doing this as an insurance policy against extinction you know because the in situ measures are going to take their time and you see the inertia of implementing them you don't want the birds to go extinct in the wild and for that reason as a last resort conservation breeding is resorted to so if you were to have many more centers it will put a lot of pressure on this only population which it cannot sustain and that's why we cannot have several breeding centers still above birds in conservation breeding start breeding themselves 
and we can establish other centers from the already collected stock which is uh, today with Rajasthan. So that would take another 15-20 years before we can have more centers established. Okay, uh, Dr. Chaudhary has uh, put in a question. Are there busted conservation plans in other states too, such as Gujarat, Karnataka, Maharashtra, and Uh Dr. Chaudhary, unfortunately not. Uh, though there is a government document by the ministry uh, which has recommended conservation plans for all states in the busted range. I don't think the states have developed their own plans as yet. And the whole idea, uh, they look at WI to help them do that. And we are in the process of mapping um, grassland patches which are greater than a critical size required for busted conservation. Once these are mapped, we need to ensure that they are kept for posterity for reintroducing these birds back into the wild. And hopefully that should happen. Ideally that should happen. But as you know, uh, there's a huge gap between the cup and the lip. Let's hope that we can push at least a few of them to be saved. I just uh, like to add that uh, Gujarat and uh, even Rajasthan have uh, drafted their recovery plan, uh, but uh, it is more of a, um, uh, more in the text rather than uh, in action. There are a lot of uh, actions that are yet to be taken on these plans in, across all the states. Uh, okay, so with that, we come to the end of the questions on the chat. I have received one question on the SMS. I just, uh, you know, get done with that. This is a question from Raj Shekhar. Uh, are there any no go areas? Why is Raj the is here. You can projects ask in B category? For so Raj Shekhar is here. I think you can ask directly. I'm here, sir. Okay. So, Raj Shekhar is raising his hand. You can ask. You can open. Sir, Raj, just I have interacted with you uh, during uh, 2015 and 2016. Uh, mainstreaming of biodiversity workshops conducted by B.B. Mathur and Asha, Madam. So then I had the opportunity to meet you most like, for the uh, brief interactions. Now my question is, like, why are the electricity projects and wind projects are uh, alone in the B category? State pollution control boards are giving the permissions. Why can't they be in the double peer reviewed category? As we have been offering, the EA draft is in, in the brink of being revived. So why can't this all these very areas in the no go areas? So before the clearances are given in uh, because EC is giving in uh, clearance and it is not being peer reviewed at times. See, most of these projects are considered to be green energy projects, which do not require environmental clearances or forest uh, clearances. Only if it comes within a protected area are clearances required. So the no go areas have to be either a national park or a sanctuary. That's the problem. And many of these areas where the bustards live are neither a sanctuary nor a, a, a national park. And that's why uh, we have to go for extra legal uh, you know, enforcement in the formation of uh, uh, eco-sensitive zone or something else from which most of these green energy projects are in any way uh, exempted. So the legal system today um, is that, uh, you know, it's at loggerheads with the survival of the bird. We need to change that somehow. We don't have a mechanism by which all these projects will come for a clearance. Yes, sir, just I wanted to note, uh, just one uh, point I wanted to add. This I've written a conservation plan related to Nakpat cement area. So they're, they're saying that bird doesn't fly 50 kilometers and the, my sighting of the birds in Adabasa sanctuary have been pruned from the minutes of the meeting. Dr. Datta, do you want to answer that question? That birds do not fly more than 50 kilometers? No, we can't. Uh, we can't, of course, say that uh, because uh, there are birds that are suddenly seen in uh, areas where uh, we, where the nearest uh, habitat is um, more than 500 kilometers away. We see birds suddenly um, appearing in Ajmer uh, or in uh, you know in many other areas in Bhavnagar. Um, where the closest other uh, population is uh, Kutch. So they must have moved from there. Even actually the tag, the, inform, uh, the tag bird in Maharashtra by another team uh, at Wildlife Minister of India, Dr. Bilal Habib, he, uh, that bird moved um, several uh, thousand uh, kilometers. And I think the longest distance between the uh, between uh, two uh, intensive use areas were much, much more than 100 kilometers. So, yeah, definitely, although they are intensive birds, they try to uh, be fixed to a particular area. So, according to our um, tagging uh, understanding, they
they uh, they intensively use 100 to 200 square kilometers of area if there are such sizable grasslands but for particular needs during non breeding season and for particular needs they do move uh, more than 100 kilometers easily and we have had that observation ourselves based on our tagged information tagged as well. thank you so uh, Shikant, i think you can take over the there are any questions people who have there, is, there is one person yes, with, uh, yes. name f seven uh, e zero i don't know there's no name here so uh, I, I have a, is there anyone who would like to ask a question please yeah uh, hi this is abhishek, hi, abhishek. Uh, can i ask a, hi yeah i just uh, had a question about uh, madhya pradesh uh, is there any information about uh, the gib conservation status in madhya pradesh and uh, are there any plans for uh, developing any habitats there? Uh, Madhya Pradesh unfortunately has um, almost lost its uh, buster. Uh, however, there are uh, some um, sightings around Gwalior. Gwalior, Ghatigao, Buster Sanctuary was the last place where uh, busters uh, used to be in Madhya Pradesh. And still, I mean, in uh, last few years, there have been some odd sightings over there. Uh, but uh, apart from uh, that Ghatigao Buster Sanctuary, uh, there is no other um, uh, no other uh, busted uh, areas over there that are currently uh, sort of viable. So even uh, Gadiyo Buster Sanctuary, it has a lot of disturbances in terms of uh, roads and power lines all around the sanctuary, and they're trying to rationalize the sanctuary. So it's a very dismal uh, sort of condition in Madhya Pradesh, uh, at least considering the first, the first sanctuary that was declared was Pereira. Yeah, the first was declared Karela. Karela lost its Most birds. Yeah. But for Florican, there is still some hope in uh, Madhya Pradesh. There are some good um, areas, Sailana, Sardarpur, Petlawar, where Floricans are still sighted. Also, although at a much less numbers, because all these areas have again been converted largely into agriculture, there are a lot of renewable energy, wind turbines over there, and the landscapes are drastically changed. Uh, there are a few breeding individuals that visit. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, still better than a Indian buster and still some scope to uh, conserve some habitats for Florida there. Thank you, sir. So, um, I have, a, anyone, anyone has a question, please? Yeah, yeah, Raju, please. Srikanth, uh, uh, to Yadavendra sir and uh, to Suthitra sir, uh, is there any special like astrology studies been undertaken for habitat improvement, improving the grassland species of this busted areas. The species of grass ideal for the busters. Well, yeah, I mean uh, they are quite generalist in terms of uh, the uh, in terms of the grass species that they prefer. We uh, did carry out studies. Even Dr. Ramani had uh, done extensive studies uh, on this aspect. Uh, they seem to be more. Um, quite, uh, quite uh, generalist in terms of uh, the grass species. However, there are some unpalatable species uh, which, uh, which have low insect abundance and therefore they don't prefer over there. Also, uh, in some areas, uh, when the grass height is uh, very high, which is typical for certain uh, you know, species of grasses, uh, like uh, Simbopogon, like Antium, you know, more so with Lassurus, uh, they do not prefer more than 70-80 um, centimeter of grass height, which sort of obstructs their visibility. They prefer more uh, open, short grass areas, which have some mosaics of tall grasses. But it is not specifically to do with the species, but rather than that the structure of the grasses. I mean, the same species, for example, Lassurus or Chrysopogon, if they're, if they're moderately grazed and kept short, they uh, happily stay over there. However, these relatively tall grasses are important for nesting, but not for the general foraging or roosting or display kind of habitats. Yeah. Can I also share the grass seeds which promotes the roosting of insects uh, in this uh, with you? Because I'm also a, I'm also an agroecologist also with you. Yes, please, please. Thank you. So. Um, Dr. Sutiga, I mean, uh, and Dr. Jala, I, I have a question, a personal question. Uh, I've been uh, from mid-October 2015 till, uh, I would say, last year, we have been only sighting 
one lone female buster in roller paru sanctuary and uh, for the past i mean uh, one in the closest uh, i think uh, side from roller paru would be the bellari side where uh, about five individuals were spotted in the in the span of five years there were five not individuals i think i would say a group of five were also spotted uh, in bellari near bellari of course so uh, do you think i mean how how was this lone female surviving there plus on top of this the other question i have is for the last 4 years i've been seeing the female laying an egg so i'm sure it doesn't have a male i mean because there is no male population seen in roller paru i'm assuming that there is no male chromosome in the egg so it is infertile so is that something which uh, we could do because i think earlier you answered this question about fertilization of the eggs so uh, artificial fertilization of the eggs it is not possible yet but is it the same case here yeah so yeah then no, no, you answer that go ahead you know the single bird that is um, uh, surviving in rola patu is just the end of the population the end of the trail uh, unfortunately uh, yes unfortunately and yes. yeah and um uh, basically when uh, you know um, such uh, it's not just for rola patu for but for many other areas like even for maharashtra and all all these populations are coming to a state where males which are the more threatened uh, sex because uh, even as juveniles they require more food requirements they have uh, uh, they are they suffer more mortality because being heavy being conspicuous they attract um, poachers they used to attract poachers earlier much more so basically uh, being threatened the males are the ones that were that are uh, dying out for fast and they have a naturally skewed sex ratio of more females than males because the mortality rate of um, males are higher so in many of these cases in maharashtra in um, kutch also in rola padu you are just seeing these last few females like the end of the trails over there okay so uh, um, yeah. the, the conservation students i'm sorry sorry sir please go bc is saying something bc please go ahead Yeah, I just wanted conscious and prudence uh, uh, makes us uh, ensure that these uh, solitary individuals or four or five individuals can become a national resource and can be taken back into a population where they have a chance of being uh, mated and being contributing to the pop production of eggs. Yeah. So what uh, B C Chaudhary is saying is absolutely ideal situation. Mm -hmm. but there are a lot of problems in doing that we have considered uh, that as rescuing these doomed to die populations they are bound to go extinct and use them for conservation breeding or try to put them back into the wild where there are birds left but uh, capturing these birds um, there's uh, and translocating them the chances of mortality is very high because these are not hand reared birds they are not uh, imprinted on humans and they'll become extremely stressed out and long journeys are unlikely to be very favorable for these birds uh the other all thing is that as soon as you remove these birds in some areas like gujarat um the only habitats left uh for are for uh, conservation of bustards and you remove the bustards from there uh, they will be taken over by developmental projects so um keeping the birds there ensures that the habitats remain uh, at least for some time even though it's at the risk of the birds uh, there is not much one can do given the current status of uh, what we know about them in transportation of these birds either to a conservation breeding facility uh in some or putting them back into the wild where there are more than few birds where they can breed so um, this is um, proposition is idealistic um uh, we have even thought about it and considered it even gujarat government has approached us to either give them a male or take the birds out of gujarat and both of them seem to be uh, not possible at this point in time because we don't have a conservation bred bird uh, male which is uh, ready to be reintroduced into the population in gujarat it will take another at least 10 years before we have a bird which is ideal for uh, reintroduction i don't think the birds in gujarat can survive that long um given a last ditch effort we would like to harness these birds uh, uh, genetic gene pool for our conservation breeding program i don't know how we're going to do it but uh, at least that's that's what we intend to do that's probably probably worth taking risk 
AIBC, I understand uh, uh, you saying that, but you can imagine if we had a dead bird while we were transporting it, most of our conservation breeding program will go for a six. Give the, um, give, give the responsibility to the Gujarat government. Don't handle it yourself. Ask them to transfer them with all the protocols, guidelines given. If you do that, that's a problem. And if they do it, you know, then there won't be much of a problem. You got to be a little tactful on that. Yes, I agree with you. We'll, we'll, I, will, I think we'll all need to join hands to get that done. Sure, sir. Sure, I think, I think yes, but uh, one, one final question from my side is uh, the, the decline in the population in Rola Padu, can that be attributed to the change in the crop and, uh, you know, declined uh, habitat? Because I think, I think uh, the grassland, most of it is still intact, but the change in crops in the nearby areas, I think uh, one Mr. Uh, I mean, our guru, Mr. Mrityanji Rao, sir, he earlier mentioned that one is the one main factor for uh, bustard would be the change in the crop, which is happening over there. Uh, yeah. So could could Isn't that I be? take this question? I think uh, there are a thousand ways bustards die, uh, and Sudhirth has mentioned most of them by what co causes the decline of these birds. Currently, you know, you remember the Greek hero Achilles. You know, the the only way you could kill that uh, hero was to shoot him in the heel, and the Achilles heel for the bustard are power lines. The current catastrophic decline of bustards is due to power line collisions. And if you were to map the advent of um, power-driven irrigation in the drylands of India and map uh, on top of that bustard extinctions, there would be only a lag of maybe about five or six years before the birds went extinct when the power lines came into their habitat. So we were not aware of this threat. We were, you know, we're still barking up some of the wrong trees because unless power lines are mitigated, uh, bustards do not have a uh, chance to live. As Sutit explained, that you know these birds are evolved to sustain high mortalities in the juvenile stages and the egg stages, but adult mortality is something which they cannot sustain. They are case-selected species. They have long life histories. They invest in a few eggs, a uh, few, a lot of parental care, but adult bird deaths is just something which they can't cope with. And um, even if you were to increase recruitment. Uh, in Jaisalmer through our enclosures and removal of predators and all that, till power lines are mitigated, bustards don't have a hope in India or anywhere else in the world for that matter. And wherever successful bustard conservation has happened in Spain, in Portugal, in Austria, uh, in um, most of Europe, they have mitigated all their power lines, uh, especially with bird diverters or made them underground in most of these areas. So you, you have to do that if you want bustards to survive. And I believe that uh, if you were to look closely at the landscape of Rola Pardo and its surrounding areas, it's not only the changing in cropping pattern, but it's also the advent of powered irrigation, which has come into the picture here. And that's what probably has caused the mortality of the birds there. Okay. Right. So thank you. Thank you. That was, that was quite a uh, different outlook, which I have now uh, the, for Rola Pardo. Thank you, sir. Yes. Shrikant. Yeah. Hello? Shravan, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, in continuation with your question, earlier question, uh, the female mm -hmm. laying egg, I would like to ask one question in continuation with your question. Sir, uh, could parthenogenic egg laying possible in GIB? Yeah. Yes, they lay infertile eggs. It's infertile. not parthenogenesis, but it is just oogenesis. Uh, they produce ova without, uh, it's a haploid. So there's no diploid egg and it, it's infertile. So they will lay Unfertilized. Egg. Yeah, it's yeah. unfertilized egg. Just like the eggs you eat at home through the poultry. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, Shrikant, I have received one question. Yes, Just, uh, thank you. Uh, this is from JVD, but the question or uh, suggestion, maybe we should have two national birds. I, I didn't, yeah. such didn't get the question. Maybe we should have two national birds. We all know the story about how the bustard was always almost made the national bird. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe by making it a national bird, we get some more political leverage. Some more protection. Currently, it's a state bird of Rajasthan. You know that. Right. Yes, uh, yes, that's true. But maybe at some uh, some stage, the pea the pea fowl can be removed as a national bird. It's now proving to be a pest in some areas. So I think we've had enough protection for the pea fowl. It's uh, time we've got the bustard back. 
and with the improved uh, English language training classes going on around the world and in our country, I'm sure they won't misspell this one word or uh, yeah. mispronounce this. I think we can change the name as well to Godavan Bustard or something else because the great Indian name itself is a sort of a death knell for it when it goes into Pakistan. And yes. Birds, birds do fly into Pakistan and uh, they're killed with a vengeance there because of the name, the great Indian Bustard. And, and if you mispronounce it and you shoot it, you know, <laughs> they, yeah. So the changing the name would also help the bird uh, to a great extent and help it to become a national bird, no doubt. So what, what goes into changing a name or the nomenclature of that? I, I think we all start using Godavan Bustard in place of Godavan Bustard. Yeah. That will be fabulous. Thank you, Dr. Jala. Thank you, sir. <laughs> that, that's a new name I, I understood today, learned today. So, Dr. Jala, I want another question. I think that's it. I can't that's get your voice across. BC here. Yeah, BC, please. Your voice is breaking up. Please speak. Yeah, go ahead, BC. Uh, the question is, you know, since it was a black buck, I think it at least the Kara and the Olapad were classic examples of the black buck population, you know, skyrocketing to huge numbers. I remember 1978, my first uh, black buck count in Olapadu was somewhere around 20, 25 uh, black buck. And I think today they are, say, they are saying take something like 1,700 bucks. So I think you know, the same is the case in Kaya. So what about the role of one endangered species to the other endangered species? Absolutely. I don't think, uh, yeah, absolute uh, good point made, BC. I think it's the, uh, the crop rating which is associated with the overabundant black buck population, which is a problem more than the black buck being a problem for the bird itself. Um, I think people resent having black buck around. They don't resent the bird, uh, the bustard as much. But uh, the black buck protection has come as a consequence of the bustard. So if you were to remove the bustard from yeah. there, the black buck automatically, you know, the protection of the department will go down dramatically. And that's what they did in Carrera. They removed the bird systematically. And uh, well, that's, that's the bird suffers. So we have to look at, see the problem with us is um, we as, uh, as a professional agency for wildlife management are rarely managing wildlife. You know, we do a protectionist job very well in some, some cases, not in all cases, but we do the protectionist part very well. But when we need to come to manage our populations, uh, that entails uh, capture, culling, translocation, removal of super abundant populations, uh, fencing uh, provided to prevent crop damage and damage to humans. I think we fail as a miserable lot across the country. And that's where we need to become really professionals and call a spade a spade. And we need to sometimes even control endangered species. Uh, we might have to start thinking about doing mm -hmm. that for tigers as well very soon uh, in some of the areas where they become super abundant. And I think that um, answers some of the questions. There are difficult choices to be made. Uh, there will be activism against it. But as a professional wildlife agency, wildlife management is uh, what we are mandated to do. And uh, removing animals, uh, culling them, and sometimes uh, mm. shooting them as well is an important task which uh, we should not shun from. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jayakala. So, uh, uh, any, anyone else? Uh, so, Javidi, sir, you like to? No, 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 no further questions. I'm, yeah. I'm Would you done like with to take over? I think we need to end the seminar now. <laughs> I think so. Well past the time. But it's been a fascinating journey, Dr. Jhala. And, and thank uh, you, Dr. Ratta, for a wonderful talk. Well. Fabulously done. Beautiful. We enjoyed every moment of it. Dinner is still a long way away. We have to move our thoughts from the talk to our dinner. That is on behalf of Deccan Birders, thank you so much for accepting our invite. Thank you, BC, for putting us in touch with two brilliant scientists. Yes, you still are nice society. Uh, full credit to you as well. And, and thank you for hosting us. We are really grateful for giving us an opportunity to talk to so many people. And we need all your support, very all of you who are on board uh, for the conservation, not only of Bustard, but for our entire biodiversity. Thank you thank all you very sir. much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jana and uh, Dr. Sativa. Thank you, Sir. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Good night. Really Good night. enjoyed it. Really enjoyed.